Hi, uh, I'm Anne Weinberg, and this is Felipe Ignacio Noriega, and we have a project called the Code Clavier, and today we'll be talking about primarily about the C calculator, but also a little bit about the Code Clavier in a whole. So to just give you a, a summary of our talk, first we'll talk about the background, then we'll talk about the Code Clavier in a whole, the C calculator, which is the Lambda Calculus calculator for the piano. We'll give a performance of around 10, 15 minutes. And then we'll discuss our motivation for building a Lambda Calculus uh, calculator, and of course talk about ideas on music and programming and what we think about combining the two. And finally talk about the future and where we think it might go. So uh, just a little history uh, background to us. Uh, we are musicians. We met uh, during our conservatory studies. I'm a classically trained pianist, and Felipe is a classical composer, but he's been programming for about 10, 15 years or so but much more intensely in the last couple of years. Um, and we had a duo called Ops, and Ops is a piano and live coding duo. And I guess many of you are familiar with live coding. Perhaps a few, not so many of you are familiar with the artistic practice of live coding, which is when people are creating and manipulating algorithms live in a performance. And this is primarily done for music or visuals. So um, Felipe uses Super Collider, which is a a domain specific language for music. Other languages which you may have heard of would be like Sonic Pi, Tidal Cycles, Overtone, um, but he's using Super Collider. Uh, so we were playing for quite some years and we were having a lot of fun, but the music was always kind of moving in a very particular way and it's very difficult to combine something as dynamic as piano playing with something like live coding, which moves at a very step-by-step -step approach. So we were also thinking, how can we bring these two artistic practices closer together? And that's when we thought, well, could we live code with the piano? And something that is a kind of a fun fact, uh, in the 19th century, when, when they were thinking about the design of a typewriter, they actually came up with a literary piano instead of what we have as a typewriter. Unfortunately, this didn't stick, otherwise I'd be a kick-ass typist. <laughs> But um, still, they thought about it back then, which I think just goes to show that the instrument always had potential to be used as a typing interface. So that was kind of our start-off point, but not our end point. So uh, Felipe will tell us a little bit about the Code Clavier project till now to give you some background. Yeah, OK. So then we decided to try. OK, let's see if Anne can actually code with the piano. So I'm not needed anymore on stage. And from the get-go, it was a really ambitious project, more ambitious than anything we had done before. So we decided to split it in like little chunks and explore and make like little systems trying to solve little problems. And uh, I th we started this two years ago. Yeah, just under two years ago. Just under two years ago. And the first little system we made it was Hello World, which was basically, okay, let's see if we can actually type with the piano. And I guess Anne wants to give her a demo very quickly, so. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, so she's really a good, uh, you know, typist. But it was also, I mean, this was just like our first proof of concept. And it, it was, it feels really silly also for us because it's just like one-to-one -one mapping of a key on the keyboard to a key on a laptop, you could say. So yeah, it's not that interesting, but it's like, okay, we can do some things. And we actually also performed this and, you know, people reacted nicely to it. Yeah. But I mean, for, uh, yeah, go on. Um, it was really kind of just substituting the interface of the computer keyboard for the piano keyboard, and they're very similar, 88 keys were around between 88 and 103 or something keys on the keyboard. But it wasn't really looking at the piano as an alternative instrument for coding. Or music. Or music, yeah. yeah. So then but it was Turing complete. <laughs> oh yeah, because, <laughs> of course. I mean, if, if she's typing, if she knows the syntax of any programming language, we could just boot that language and she could be typing valid syntax and valid yeah. programs, which I don't know if you did. Maybe you did. <laughs> um, 
So then we decided, okay, we need to make this more musical. So then we did another little system, which is called Motipets. And this was more into trying to recognize uh, musical patterns, or that's motifs in music. That could be like a little melody or a chord or a tremolo, which are two notes being played rapidly and alternating, and trying to map that to blocks of code, to snippets. So it Can would be- Can do a demo? Okay. So I could play a nice musical motive like this to call a complete snippet. And normally this would run in Super Collider, so then you would also have sound, but for the demo, uh, we're just running it in the terminal. And we also had a setup for block programming, so if I wanted to set up conditional for my playing, I could, for example, do this. So I'm saying if I play the right number, uh, 100 notes in a period, in en no, in 100, yeah, 100 notes in n seconds, then I will set up the result which would be a piano cluster takeover, which again, you're not going to hear. And then I set how many seconds, and I'm gonna be easier on myself today, so let's make it 17. And voila, I pass. Of course, I can also fail, and there are other conditionals that we apply. Um, we also combine these two to form a joint one, which we call the hybrid. And if you visit our website, you can check a bunch of performances. And we also wrote a paper about the first two prototypes, which you can also find on our website. Yeah, so what happened there, if you could notice, is that Anne was playing the specific motifs that were matching specific code snippets from a library of snippets that we have. And then she was chaining those together. So it was. We want to, we call that a bit like block programming. So she is able, she has flexibility in how she chains the different code snippets together. Uh, but for us, that was still a bit limiting. It was a bit more musical. We're now trying to understand music, not just like typing. But uh, it was, everything was very kind of hard coded. It was like, okay, this specific uh, phrase or this specific sequence of notes is this specific uh, snippet. This specific chord is this snippet, et cetera, and she will be flexibly changing those. But for us, that meant like, okay, either we need a, a very big library of snippets, and it just is, it, it, does, it doesn't feel flexible enough. It doesn't feel like she can really code or, or program. I can only call exist pre existing code, which can still create a very nice musical or artistic experience, which is kind of our primary field, but. Uh, to really become programming, we needed to go one step deeper, and then we went to... One step higher in abstraction. <laughs> so we were like, okay, uh, we don't need just to uh, be able to parse specific snippets and match them, or sorry, music motives. We need to understand what a melody is. So not a melody that is this specific melody, but a melody in general, in the abstract sense from above. Or what is a chord? You know, not just this chord, but any chord, or a tremolo, etc. So thinking about these things and this abstraction, that's how we came across Lambda Calculus. Um, and it really blew us away, I think. And we thought like, okay, we definitely have to explore this. So we started kind of a parallel branch of development where we were thinking, okay, let's just try to get the, the basic concepts correctly. And um, we thought, let's start easy also, because we don't know what we're getting into. And we thought, let's start like doing just uh, numbers, and like uh, 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 calculations and operations on those numbers, which would be uh, like a, a very basic calculator, an arithmetic calculator that we wanted to do. So what we did is that um, we started to approach everything as a function then, and I'll show you a bit of the code there. So we were defining our basic Lambda functions, like uh, a, a zero or the identity function there. Also a select first, which would be uh, true. We also have select uh, second or false. Uh, just, uh, we also have like a uh, function application function. And then uh, we also did our evaluator that is basically beta reduction. And um, probably for the ones who recognize it, you can see that this is Python. And well, I was expecting another reaction, but 
we have good and bad reasons for, for doing this, but we can talk about that uh, at the end if you have questions. So, and we wanted to do numbers, and of course, the nice realizations for us was like, oh, like numbers are also functions. That's, that was like really, really great for us. Because then really everything was a function. So we also defined like uh, a way for her to do successors. So we have our, our successor function that makes a successor of whatever you put into it. And basically that way we were able to now not map the, the piano to code blocks or not map the code piano to certain characters from the keyboard, but actually map the piano to functions and also be recognizing the piano as functions. Um, I think, should do you, I think, I mean, we want to perform now. We'll probably do just a little explanation of what will happen and then we'll perform. So something else that we have uh, in this one is we have ostinato recognition, which uh, comes back from our roots and my, particularly my piano style when we play as a duo. Um, because Felipe, when he live codes, he creates a lot of layers in sound. I try to kind of mimic that with my playing. So I also create a lot of layers and I make an ostinato. That's, so that was kind of the way that we decided to make it possible for me to create functions in this one. So um, yeah, so how this will work is that like, uh, we'll be like a duo again, and down here, that's me on the white screen, and like the super interesting part is Anne Feinberg, which is up there on the black screen. So what you will be seeing on that column is when uh, she is actually putting lambda functions together. You will see that. Uh, well, you can do one. Uh, you can do an, uh, maybe a, a number. Okay. So, you know, successor of a successor of a successor of zero. And then that on the stack that prints a three, which is mainly like a, like that's mainly for Anne to know where she's going because it's also difficult to follow everything if you're just doing successors. And on the result, you will be seeing the result when Anne decides to evaluate the whole stack. Okay, uh, that's a five. And um, this is being broadcasted also with uh, OSC, Open Sound Control, uh, to you know via UDP, so I can grab it. And then I can grab it and just put it in, in something I will make. And um, here on the final one, that's kind of, uh, for us, one of the also breakthroughs we had is that Anne is able to define her own functions, just putting together the basic functions from Lambda Calculus. So I guess you want to do one? Okay, there you go, you did it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think your mic is out, by the way. But So the interesting thing here was that she was able to construct like another function using those things and also give it a name, let's say. So she could decide how to play that function. She could map it to whatever she wanted. In this case, she mapped it to this chord there. Yeah. So she... Okay, yeah, she can go higher and higher. And um, so that was nice that now she could, okay, now she can define her own functions, give it a name and then call them. That was for us like really a breakthrough. And as you could see, we, we have addition and multiplication. So we're using these you know, recursive functions to be able to do these arithmetic operations. And let's give a performance. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's also nice about this is I have a lot of notes which are not coding, so I will just also integrate that coding into my more general piano playing.
34. 40. 27. 38. 19. 37. 38. 37. 24 23 22 21 32 352 334 327 326 333 666 651 643 
Thirteen, twenty seven, twenty six, twenty five, twenty four, eighteen, six, five. Twenty-seven. and six. Fourteen. 
Thank you. Well done. Felipe, why did we build a Lambda Calculus calculator for the piano? Oh, okay. For that, I have to go to the next slide. You have to go to the next slide. Okay. So this is the slide that I always get wrong. Let's see. Um, like basically. Uh, this is going back and thinking of our original goal. Like we want to allow Anne or any pianist for that case to be able to code through the piano, through playing the piano. So not just clicking notes, but making music with the piano. And uh, Lambda Calculus gave, you know, gave us the, the tools to represent abstractions, uh, in this case, computing abstractions. And we learned how to you know, understand and formalize computing or computation. And in that sense, when we're thinking about music, it's common to say music is also abstract. Maybe everyone or a lot of people have heard that. So we were thinking, can we also use Lambda Calculus or can this inspire us to find some sort of formalism to understand the abstractions in music? And the idea behind this is that if we can do this, then we will be able to have functions for music, which we will be able to easily match with functions for computation. And um, hopefully we will just bridge or bring piano closer to this. And I think Lambda Calculus, like, I don't know if this is why we build it, but this is what we learned, I guess, is that, you know, when you treat everything as a function, then not only in what she's producing as a computation, but the way she's putting data inside, like if the data she's giving to the computer are also functions, we just feel we're like very close, or we, we see kind of light at the end of the tunnel, let's say. Uh, do you want to say something else? Well, I, I guess we were thinking about the different abstract levels of music. For example, a note can have a meaning in itself, but it can also be part of a melody. Or it can be part of a chord or it can be completely insignificant. Um. Mm -hmm. For example, and then it's just a passing note. Yeah, so we're trying to think like, how can we then define all these things as, as functions or propositions? Um, so start to approach a note, maybe as a, as a type or silence, and then what would be the relationship of that in, depending on the context and trying to find the functions for that. Um, so, Anne, can music teach us anything about programming or can it mean anything for programming? Well, music has a history of functionality. We talk a lot about functional harmony, certainly not the way I play, as I'm sure you just noticed. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, especially during the Baroque era, when with Bach, we often talk about the founder of classical music as we know it today. There were certainly like harmonic rules and the functional harmony set up. And of course, we could follow those rules now, but we think that music has shifted a lot. And why would we follow the rules that were set up some 300 years ago? Um, so I think by having this ostinato portal approach, I can define my own harmonic space, so, uh, sonic space, and then um, use that as functions, which I think is quite interesting. A big thing about playing the chord that you're making is that you're turning uh, music is about process, right? You don't go to a concert to just sit there and wait for the applause at the end. You're about there for the whole experience from start to stop. And I think that's something that's generally different to coding because coding, when you ask for by a client to make something, they want a final product that isn't going to crash. They're not really interested in how you got there. Um, and that's really different. And that's what talk about live coding. I say it should be the code clavier is about live coding, not necessarily programming in an offline situation. It's a very much a performative experience, and I think it can be used to really highlight the beauty of the code that you're making. At least that's what we hope. But so process, not just outcome, is really crucial. And for me, as I play, um, 
it's kind of this com combination of intuitive and reason thinking. So I have to really think about the function I'm trying to create and what that involves physically, but also I'm just trying to play. Um, uh, like, like the loop? Wait, she, I haven't finished yeah. that. No, that's the loop. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also thinking about how I'm going to, um, trying to just incorporate that, squeeze that into the playing that I'm trying to make. So it's kind of combining these two very different thought processes to, together, which in the end creates this loop because, uh, so we've been very lucky that Barbara has lent us her digital piano. Uh, the code clavier is conceived for an acoustic MIDI piano, or we also now have a MIDI fire, so we can make any piano, uh, any acoustic piano also MIDI, um, which just means that the sound of the piano should never be um, ignored. It's always there. And then we use MIDI as the communication protocol with the laptop and the program and the system. Um, so this idea that the music is constantly controlling the programming and the programming is always influencing the music and that. Yeah, we have some sort of positive feedback loop. Let's yeah. Say. yeah. Um, okay, so about the future, like where, where do we think or where do we want to go from here? Is that um, we want and to be able to define more complex functions. And I think what we mean by that is that we want her to be able to uh, put a recursion function in there to define recursion also. I think we think that that's the next step. And once we have that, that she can do it because right now she's, let's say, calling functions that already have it built in, then we unleash the power. Yeah. And uh, so that's one of the next steps we're gonna do, definitely. And we're also going to incorporate some of our more motivic uh, recognitions in terms of what the, what the functions actually are. For now, we're just using single notes which is really advantageous in the sense that I have a lot of free notes in which I can play and a lot of free notes that I can make new functions with, but it does suggest that like a successor function is just uh, one single note, for example. So it'd be interesting to incorporate a variety of different ways to call the Yeah, yeah we, we, will, we will extend the way the, the Anne is giving information to the computer. Yeah. Like we will try to parse music in a more dynamic way. Yeah. Uh, right now we have like ostinato recognition, which are patterns of repeated notes. The, the, already the code clavier can distinguish if a pattern is played and then how the pattern is developed. And the way it's developed is the way she's defining the functions. Yeah. So right now she's doing like one argument functions, but if she develops it where she changes two pitches of the pattern, then she's defining a two argument function, etc. And um, so we want to like sit down and think like, okay, these are all the elements that we know about music thanks to music theory. Let's try to see if we can find a way to understand all those in functional terms. Yeah. I think that's something we really want to do and probably we'll need the help from Norwegian friends for that. <laughs> um, but I think what's also really exciting is that we, that we see this as a core because right now you saw I was actually just making numbers and unlike the other prototypes, I actually don't make any sound, uh, which in other ones, we have this music output extension, but we're looking at other code output extensions. So from March, we will start an augmented reality extension uh, uh, with the uh, Linda May uh, systems uh, using Lambda Calculus. And we're also go, I really want to do some 3D printing or kind of any other creative. Um, so that imagine you're playing and then at the end of the concert, you have this like mini sculpture that you made, I think that'd be super cool. Yeah, yeah. so Anne likes all these like artistic applications. Yeah. And I like the less artistic applications, but uh, in the end it's hard to not go out of that because it's a piano, right? But um, definitely, I also want to try to push this more to the, like the non-artistic outputs of what she could do with the cold clavier. So, you know, who knows, maybe she could even just try to program something different. I mean, it's already a calculator, so it could be extended so that she can fill in her tax application or I don't know. Uh, like this goes to different places and we argue about that all the time, but I definitely would like to push it more to the non-performative non, uh, artistic application. I also make the code clavier an, an offline thing. It doesn't have to be on stage all the time, right? I mean, you could play in your room and stuff. You could, yeah. Um, but finally. Yeah. So finally, kind of one of the, the things that we try to think about and we are pursuing with our with research is um, 
you know, we think about, or you can see it in a lot of art, or I would say most of the art nowadays, uh, they employ and use technology and they embrace new technology to create art, new art. And we want to see if we can shift this and actually use art to create technology. Yeah. Um, and really ambitiously, we wonder, could we one day have a musical paradigm in programming? And on that, on that question of a thought, we'd like to thank you for your time and attention and for coming to our talk. Well, because if we have musical paradigm, that means Anne could be applying for job applications on the WUBA app. And, and we wouldn't cool. be living on arts funding, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, if you have some, well, we have some question time, but also if you uh, want to talk to us about the project, please feel free to come and talk to us after or send us an email. We'd yeah. really love to hear from you and uh, yeah. See, always looking for new collaborations and uh, discussions. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, so like Anne said, we have plenty of time for questions. So have you tried uh, because you're playing piano, so have you tried playing uh, the songs already written and by this running some program? For, uh, for I imagine like some sort of Vivaldi or, 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 or let us say Be the Beatles mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, um, and have you had any like output from there? Or? Uh, if I have a, the calculator running and I play something written, I might get some sort of functions coming out, but that's not, um, I think it's important for the pianist to also be engaging with the calculus that they're engaging with. So, I mean, it might be possible and you might get something, but it wouldn't be intentional. And I think it's not um, necessarily the way I want to go with the code for this. Okay, so because I have a follow-up question, so could it, with, Let's, let's imagine a particular system of mapping keys and sequences of music uh, to certain uh, elements of program. So could you like check if music or val evaluate music if it's good by uh, the program's output it generates? I suppose you could do that, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard because maybe it is like a really nice piece of music and the output is kind of gibberish. Like you don't know if the, the pr programmatic output is makes sense or in what sense does it make sense. So, it, I mean, the thing with this project is that it kind of very clearly divides this thing of the program as an output and then the way you're making it. But we also have a lot of discussions based on this because uh, like sometimes I like to use the work intuition, which Anne doesn't like to use. So like try to see what happens if also she just improvises, not necessarily just play like a Chopin piece or something and see if that, if you could achieve like some sort of programming logic that is based on intuition. But Anne, who is really the main user and who sits down and programs this, uh, she says that even though she's playing and she's also reacting to the sound and to her emotions, a part of her brain is never going away from, from the logic of what you're trying to make. Yeah, but I also say that when I play normal piano, there's always a very active part that's never just playing intuitively. Um, I think it's a really false misconception that musicians play completely intuitively. We think very hard about what we're doing all the time. So that's my biggest thing about it, but that was not really his question, I think. We didn't answer. But, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> Like you could, it wouldn't crash, but it, it will not crash. necessarily print out numbers. It will print, we don't know what, and then we need to And it's just not something it. that we've explored till now because it's not in our priorities at the moment. So my question is probably related to, to the previous one. Uh, is your goal eventually to produce a relationship between arts and logic so that mu music that is pleasing to the, to the ear also generates some useful logic or is the other way around? What's the eventual goal? What do you think about that? I think it's a mixture of both. We're kind of curious to see where it will go. We have, don't have a concrete idea that we want to apply music, long, music logic to programming or programming to music. We want to kind of see what happens when you combine them 
And I think in the end, you get kind of a very mixed logic. Also, like sometimes I really mess up my lambda calculus equations, also because I don't have a backspace button, or I might miss a note. So they're like very musical things that influence the success and non-success, or just because I'm still not that familiar with it, so I forget the identity function or something. But I, I think it's a very exciting, that's one of the things that we're really excited about, is just to see where it will go and how it will influence growth. I mean, that, that's one of sort of the biggest challenges we face, that can we make an interesting program with interesting music? Or can music that sound good also render a valid and nice result in programming terms? And that's one of the things we keep exploring and we are striving for. But if we have like a piece of music that is, let's say, known to be a beautiful piece of music, that's a, a more difficult question because also like music theory and music, let's say, taste changes all the time across cultures, across time. And I guess the same happens with programming, maybe also the, the approach to programming and what is considered. I mean, for the computer, not for the computer, it would be like, OK, I understand this program or I, I cannot execute it. But I, I would also ask, like, how could you evaluate like the, the beauty of a program or the elegance of a program? I think with the other thing with having a, a, a set piece of music and then making that code is that I think uh, the way that we're approaching live, it's really about live coding with the piano, not necessarily making very solid programs. So if you have a, a written out piece of music, then you know the outcome. And I think that's not really that exciting for what we're trying to do, which is about kind of seeing where it takes you. So that was also- Although we disagree on that too. But it, no, we, well, anyway, <laughs> okay. So uh, you said that you have a, a MIDI fire. Yeah. So does that mean that you can actually use any instrument? Oh, no, our MIDI player is for a piano, so it's a... Any keyboard instrument with 88 ah, notes. okay. Yeah. There are plenty of other MIDI instruments that are also solo line. The code for it could theoretically work on any MIDI instrument. It's pretty tailored at the moment to the piano, and that's the way we want to keep it. I think the piano is much broader, like, a, like solo instruments, like a flute, for example, or violin. You don't really have MIDI violins, but... Um, <coughs> you have pretty good audio to MIDI converter, so it could be possible. They have much more limited range and much fewer possibilities to play two notes at the same time, let alone three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So from that point of view, that's just not something that we're exploring at the moment because like we, like, uh, like Felipe said in the beginning, we've only been working on this for under two years and I'm not a programmer, so it's really Felipe that's doing the work on his own. So we hope that in 10 years time, there'll be like a code clavier maybe for the EWI or something but it's just not a priority at the moment. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. So um, let's give Anna and Felipe a closing round of applause. Thank you.